Hi, I'm Steve and Zero UP. Hi, Steve. I am the uh, ARRL appointed um, emergency coordinator for Douglas County for the Amateur Radio Emergency Service. I have a brief program that uh, I stole from somebody else. So we're going to kind of skip over some of it pretty quick. Maybe. Okay. Basically, it goes over the history of the ARRL. Um, by 1914, there were thousands of amateur radio operators. Uh, Harry Percy Maxim, who was an inventor, and invented all sorts of fun things such as um, the car muffler and the firearm silencer. Uh, saw the need for an organization to band together this, uh, the group of uh, radio experimenters. And in May 1914, he founded the ARRL. Today, the ARRL has more than 156,000 members. It's the largest or organization of radio amateurs in the United States. ARRL has five pillars, including public service, ad advocacy, education, technology, and membership. And for the public service, uh, emergency communications, training, radio clubs, uh, instruction, instructors and examiners, and ARRL field, field organization are uh, parts of the public service. We're mainly going to uh, look at the emergency communications. Skip ahead a little bit. The purpose of amateur radio is defined in Part 97 of the Federal Communication Rules. It consists of five principles. Uh, basically, uh, 97.1a says recognition and enhancement of the value of amateur radio service to the public as a voluntary non-commercial communication service, particularly with respect to providing emergency communications. And then B is uh, continuation and extension of the amateur's proven abilities to contribute to the advancement of the radio art. And to encourage and encouragement and improvement of the amateur service through rules would provide for advancing skills of both the communications and technical phases of the art. So the ARES program anytime now. <laughs> ARES consists of approximately thirty five thousand licensed amateurs who have voluntarily registered there are qualifications and equipment for communications, duty, and public service when disaster strikes. Anyone is eligible to join ARES if you have a amateur radio license. You need to have a willingness to serve, <coughs> which is such thing as a siren test. Uh, we do storm spotting. Uh, we also provide uh, disaster communications. I think the last disasters that we were really involved with were the Miller tornado and the flooding that uh, slowly overtook most of the Missouri River and most of the central part of the United States. What ARES does is provide a supplemental or backup communications to the public service and disaster relief agencies when normal means of communications are overloaded or unavailable. One such time was uh, on September 11th um, we had a couple of amateurs that went to what used to be, or what was the Red Lion Hotel and now I believe is the Double Tree. And there were a couple of amateurs that were here at the Red Cross. Um, in 2001, cell phone service wasn't as uh, solid in most of Omaha. So when they were at the Red Lion Hotel downtown, it was difficult for the, the Red Cross workers to get a cell phone signal out of there while they were providing shelter services for all those marvelous people who were stranded in Omaha. So what would, they would do is they would go find their ham and ask them to have somebody from uh, here call them 
and a specific phone number. Or someone for here would have one of us, the hams here, call down there to find Joe and have them call back to the Red Cross. So while the normal communication systems weren't entirely overloaded, the cell phones that they had were just not reliable. So they tapped the, the ham community to help facilitate their normal communications. ARES also provides uh, communications for planned public service events throughout the year. One of those is the upcoming siren test. Um, a lot of activities that the club does in some areas would be considered ARES activities. Uh, but since we have a strong club, uh, they are club activities, but a lot of the people that volunteer at them are also ARES members. So in the little tiny print, it says ARES is deployed for a vital, uh, variety of emergencies and disasters. Um, ice storms in the southwest, hurricanes uh, Katrina and Rita in 2005, uh, the tsunami of the Indian Ocean, uh, Amtrak train uh, derailment in 2004. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, the Omaha tornado in, was it 1975? Uh, yep. So there are four levels to the ARES program. There's the national level, and that's out of Newington, Connecticut. The section level, which uh, would be the, the section manager of the uh, state of Nebraska, which is Matt K-A-0-B-O-J, and then his section EC, I don't remember his call sign, but his name is Lonnie and he lives in Davie, Nebraska. And then there is the local uh, portions. I would be the EC for Douglas County. And then Dennis, uh, KC0YKN, would be the DC for Sarpy County. On the national level, there's a national uh, emergency coordination at the ARRL headquarters, is under the ARRL Emergency Preparedness Manager. And they are responsible for advising all ARES officials on disaster communications issues. Um, Basically, what they do is they try and keep records of who in what area is in charge of what. So the reports that the Section EC files with the National Preparedness Manager will say that I am the EC for Douglas County. So if the, they can't get a hold of the Section Manager or the Section EC, they can try and get a hold of me directly in case of a disaster. Uh, ARES has memorandums of understanding with a pretty large group of um, relief organizations, including the Salvation Army, the Red Cross, the National Weather Service, the Department of Homeland Security, um, a couple of the larger faith-based disaster relief organizations uh, also have MOUs with uh, ARES that an ARES member would be allowed to participate with them if they were deployed for a disaster. So getting to the state level, we have the section manager, which is elected by the ARRL members, which is Matt K-0-B-O-J, and then he appoints a section emergency coordinator. And then the, we don't have a district level. So at the local level, the section EC then appoints the local EC, uh, usually with the help of the section EC. And that appointment uh, is typically for two years. And then it's pretty much renewed as long as you're not totally messing everything up. Um, if anybody wishes to participate in uh, ARES management, see me. Uh, I am always looking for my replacement. Uh, eventually, I'm going to become just a little bit busier than I am now, and the whole apple cart's going to fall down. Mm -hmm. 
covered that. I do have several uh, assistant emergency coordinators. Uh, one of them is Mary and Zero TRK. Uh, another one is um, Jim Westcott, who was in the Waldo hot hat earlier. And then uh, Greg Babbitt, who has uh, found himself just as busy as I have lately. So if to be an EC, you have to be a member of a the ARRL. To be an ARES member, you need to have an amateur radio license of any class, technician, uh, even those that have not upgraded beyond the old novice call signs or novice license classes. I, I would welcome their participation in the ARES. Uh, we would. Uh, we do ARES registrations a few times a year. Uh, one of those is going to be coming up at the ARES meeting. Also, if you want to register with the ARES and you're not going to be able to attend the meeting, just let me know. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet for the cyber test up here. Just go ahead and put your name, call sign, how I can get a hold of you, and I can send you the, the registration form. But you must be willing to participate in some ARES activities. Uh, Meetings, training sessions, drills, exercises, public service events, and actual disasters. Uh, typically, come June, I'll declare field day to be an ARES activity. So if you want to participate in ARES, come out to field day. It's a good time, and we have food. We hope we don't have any actual disasters. Last year was a nice calm year. Didn't have too many uh, weather activations. It was, uh, it was good. So, for training requirements for ARES, the ARRL, of course, recommends their introduction to emergency communications. It's the basic training that all ARES members need to know. That really is kind of an optional thing. I, I have taken it. Um, I think Mary has taught the class a couple times. Uh, Barb and Jim Westcott also mentored people through that. Uh, there's good information. But I'm not sure if it's worth the, the time and the um, expense of doing that. Um, a lot of the stuff you can learn by participating in some of our drills, ex, uh, activities, exercises, and just generally coming to club meetings and, and being a ham. They also recommend the IS-100B and 700A. At one time, that was a requirement to work with Douglas County Emergency Management as part of uh, ARES for ARES activities, including storm spotting. Within the last week, they have dropped that requirement, um, which I think is a good thing that you don't have to do it now. But I still would recommend that anyone who wants to participate uh, get these classes. In addition to being good classes to take, one of the things that uh, it affects is how much federal reimbursement money the city and the counties can receive um, in the event of a disaster. The more people that volunteer for them that have taken the FEMA classes, the more money that FEMA is willing to send back to them in the event of a disaster. And I kind of like to see it with my Federal tax dollars come back to my community. Um, I think it's a good thing. For advanced training, again, another ARRL class. Uh, they are good classes. I just don't know really how much value they add to, to what we do. Are these classes, can you take them online? The FEMA classes you can take online, and they are free. The ARRL classes are also taken online, but I believe there to be a cost to them. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. When I took them back before they redid the whole program, I think it was like 80 bucks. And that's why I'm kind of not, I'm not so sure if they're worth the, the 80 bucks. Um, I 
think if I were to be looking at taking them now, I think I'd put that <coughs> 80 bucks to a new, towards a new radio. <coughs> So to join the ARES, you contact me, your EC, um, put your name on the sign-up sheet with that you want a uh, 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 registration form, fill the form out, send it back to me, uh, and we'll get you registered for ARES. Uh, also on that same form, uh, there will be places to check if you want to volunteer specifically or in addition to help more with the Red Cross or the Salvation Army. Uh, the Salvation Army has their own uh, radio network. It's called Saturn, which is the Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network. Uh, we are also looking, we're also always looking for persons that are willing to take some of their Saturdays and go to the Salvation Army and check into the Saturn net on the, using the HF radio there. I think, uh, Kevin, don't they do the net every Saturday? Saturn net? Saturn nets every Saturday. Okay. At 9, I think it's literally, I think it's 9.30-ish. Down on the 465, I think. I think it's, it's the Southwest okay. net. Yep. Yeah, that's what it's called. As part of ARES, the ARRL also has the HAM-8 program. And uh, that is supported by business, businesses, manufacturers, and art, uh, individual co uh, contributions. Basically, what the HAM aid will do is in the event of an emergency or a major disaster, the ARRL will send out in the best possible way um, a kit. This happens to be a picture of their high frequency HAM aid kit, which. Uh, Looks like that's an ICOM 718. It looks like there's a tuner in there, a power supply, some coax, and a dipole. They will also send out the HT handmade kit, which comes with basically a box of HTs, chargers, batteries, and all the goodies. In the event of a disaster, that may be very important. We may have more operators available than we have reliable equipment. We may need to dispatch more equipment to uh, other places. Uh, this stuff is all available through the league. We'll skip over the about the ARRL and we'll get to Steve. This one. And then we will have questions. Norm. Let's go back to the radio you just had, the one on 718 there, and I have a question too. What's the, what are you talking about here? Uh, is this a, something they send to you or is this a Saturn? This is something that the ARRL has in a room in the headquarters building. You can see back here. When you say headquarters, do you mean a in Newark? Yeah, Newington, Connecticut. Oh, not around here. Okay. Well, okay. We'll push it That's out a long you know. way away. Well, we'll push it out to you, though. In, in the event of a major disaster, like let's say we had a big tornado that tore the major swaths through Omaha. They would be able to get this box to probably within 100 miles of us fairly quickly. That last 100 miles might take a little while, but when you are in need of some additional equipment to get more, handle more traffic or get more stuff on the air, getting it that close would be phenomenal. And if you see in the background, you have one kit here, but I count one, two, three, four, five, just in the background of that picture. So they have a fairly large cache of radios. Now at the Salvation Army, we have something similar, but it has a VHF, UHF uh, mobile radio in it. Um, I believe there's like three of them out there. Or VHF, UHF mobile radios, power supplies, small antennas, that kind of stuff. Um, then also with OMMRS, which is uh, the Omaha Metro Medical Response System, uh, or OMERS, they also have several go kits, uh, not only with HF radios, but with VHF, UHF, and 220 radios on. So in the event of that they would be necessary, we could mobilize those and send them out to somewhere. Uh, the same radios that are in the hospitals, only in a mobile box. 
Now the next slide, which is the walkie talkies. Yep. Would that require a computer to program them before they're usable? Or a manual we have to study for a half an hour, hour, well, or hope to get it right, or is it easy to when that, I was looking that would at be a disaster to take something out and not know how to use it. When I was looking at this picture, it appears that this is the, uh, an ICOM radio. And I know that <coughs> ICOM was one of their partners when they designed or developed this. Uh, <coughs> it looks like right here is the manuals. And then I look up here and I see a whole slew of AA batteries. There's a whole bunch of them right up there. So most likely they all have AA battery packs on them so that you can just swap out the batteries instead of having to find 120 volts of charge, plug in your charger and get going again. But most likely they send the manual with it. And if it's like any standard non-Chinese radio, they all program about the same. Uh, most of the time in the event of a disaster, if you were to get something like this, uh, you'd probably get probably three crates of those shipped in. And you have to ship them back when you're done. Uh, you'd be able to program it fairly quickly. Once you have one guy look through the book to figure out how to program it, then that one guy does all the programming. So I hope I'm not that guy. <laughs> Oh, does that answer? Oh yeah, yeah. Make clear as mud. Okay. Anyone have any questions? I know I kind of hopped around for ARES. No. You mentioned at the beginning that you're the EC for Douglas. Yes. Does that mean there's 92 other ECs in the state of Nebraska? No. There are some counties that, uh, or some ECs that have multiple counties. Uh, when you get out into the western part of Nebraska when the, where the cows outnumber the people, one person may be the EC of six or eight counties. Like uh, Douglas County has an EC, um, Dodge County has an EC, that would be Dave Theopolis, W0, NRW. Um, it's Dave T from the Weather Service for those people that have been around a while. Um, Sarpy County is Dennis, KC0YKN. Uh, I'm not sure who the EC of Saunders County is, but when Lancaster County has is Reynolds. Uh, as you get into the less populated areas, uh, the, there's one person that does a larger geographic area. But they also don't go out and organize a siren test. Uh, when they do weather spotting, they might be putting some people out in certain portions of the communities or near the communities and not necessarily trying to cover an entire county. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, that's, I guess that's what I have. I'll put the calendar back up. Thank you.